tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. These days, when you're working on team business projects and you're here, and the rest of the team is anywhere but where you're at, it kind of makes things difficult, right? Monday.com can fix that. It's scary stories told in the dark. The only way we can make this magic happen is remotely. Working remotely all the time can cause it fair and not so fair share of problems. And Monday.com helps solve those problems. Monday.com brings teams together so you can plan, manage, and track everything your team is working on in one centralized place. Providing a flexible platform which allows you to manage people, projects, and external tools. And best of all, Monday.com is easy to use. It's flexible, improves coordination between your teams and departments, and you can customize it to fit a specific workflow. And with that ease comes confidence. So if you want your team to be more effective than ever, visit Monday.com for your free two-week trial. Build confidence within your team and reach every goal with ease. Visit Monday.com for your free two-week trial. When your teamwork is effective, nothing can stop you. Go to Monday.com to start your free 14-day trial today. <laughs> Good evening. I'm storyteller Otis Gyre, and I ain't your grandfather. From where I'm from, we don't do bedtime stories. And if that's what you were expecting, you're in the wrong place. If it's terrifying tales you're after, well then. I've got just the thing. Get comfortable. Settle in. Turn off the lights, if you dare. Your night is about to get a whole lot darker. <laughs> Who needs sleep anyway? <laughs> <laughs> Good evening. You're listening to Scary Stories Told in the Dark. Welcome to Season 7, Episode 9. I'm your host, Otis Jiry, and in this episode, I'll be performing six spine-chilling tales for you, all of them from author David Fulman, about cryptic containers, psychic seekers, nightmarish nightmare, creepy cards, and so much more. You're listening to the standard edition of tonight's program, which contains the first three terrifying tales. If you'd like to show your support and enjoy an extended version of this and other episodes with twice the terror, visit simplyscarypodcast.com and click Patrons in the upper menu to sign up today. Thank you for your support. Now it's time to take a walk together down the moonlit trail. So lock your doors, turn your lights down low, and settle in. The show is about to begin. <laughs> Our first tale tonight, from David Fueling, introduces us to a gentleman recounting how he came into possession of an item with far more than sentimental value. Without further ado, I present to you, I inherited my father's snuff box. I'm used to mysteries in my life. I never met my mother, for example. My dad used to talk about her all the time, but she always felt like a pretend character, or like maybe she was just an ordinary best friend of his. Dad passed away a few months ago, so I can't ask him for any new details. He left me something in his will, though. It explained a lot that I hadn't understood before. 
There were still mysteries, but the snuff box has revealed more than I have ever expected to know. The portable steel container with a heavy lock on it was stored under Dad's bed during my whole childhood. Whenever I asked him about it, he would answer that it was his snuff box. He would always grin wryly, as though making a joke I couldn't understand. It was a weird kind of pun, I think. He never used tobacco, and so the only other meaning I could imagine was that it had something to do with killing. My father seemed like a gentle man, though, and so I chalked it up to English being his second language. I was given a key to the snuff box as part of Dad's final wishes. After he passed, I waited a few days to open the container. Years of foggy guesses had made me hesitant to learn more. I finally opened the box, though, and was relieved to find that it only contained documents and photographs. They were all seemingly normal keepsakes. On top was a picture of Dad with my mom while she was still pregnant with me. It was the youngest and clearest photograph of her that I'd ever seen. Dad looked happy, just like I remembered him to be in life. Under that picture, though, were a dozen or so pictures of my dad alone. I wasn't in these other pictures, and neither was my mom. In every single photograph, my father's eyes were hard and hollow. He looked positively haunted by something in every picture taken of him between the years of 1961 and 1969. I was eight years old when my father took me out of East Germany. I was eleven by the time he brought me to America. It's strange to think back and remember little snippets of certain days that the snuff box documents. I don't remember my father killing anyone, but I do remember him leaving me in the car at a freight traffic checkpoint near the Berlin Wall. I remember sitting quietly while the engine ran idle for what felt like a long time. After that, I do recall my father hustling back into the driver's seat, looking grimier and less steady than he had been before getting out of the car. This is what I've been able to piece together about those years. These are the clues from my father's snuff box. 1961. I know from my father's stories that I was born desperately premature, such that I was unlikely to survive. It was the summer of 1961, after all, and technology to sustain premature babies was crude and often completely unavailable in poorer parts of the world. Such was the situation in East Berlin. I knew all this already, but the snuff box provided a few new details that I hadn't known. My mother had gone to stay with her family across town in West Berlin on August 10th, she was there to visit the relatively upscale medical and hardware stores so that a better incubator might be built for the still ailing infant me. In the snuff box were hand-drawn designs for the incubator. The handwriting was not my father's. It could only have been my mother who knew enough about medical treatment to create and build a contraption. On the morning of August 13th, my father called my mother and told her to hurry because the border between East and West Berlin was being sealed by the Volksmarie soldiers. In the snuff box, there was a blurry picture of three people dressed like soldiers in front of a tangle of concrete barricades and barbed wire. Partially obscured behind the early Berlin Wall fortifications is a woman I believe to be my mother. Another picture, dated three days later, shows more fortifications, and the same woman waving to the photographer from behind the growing snarl of hindrances. Even despite two soldiers standing to block her way, she's doing her best to be seen by my father on the other side. Dad still thought he'd surely see his wife again soon, after the confusion was cleared up. His diary entries at the time expressed this naive hope. There's little in the snuff box from 1962, but the year after that included several important new documents that served as helpful pieces of the puzzle. In the far right corner of this second picture, standing on the East German side, is a man wearing neat and professional clothes 
who's glaring out of the corner of his eyes at my father while he takes a picture. I wouldn't have noticed the man there, except my father circled him with a red marker. In German, my dad has labeled the man with question that was dated March 24, 1965. Almost four years later, Dad apparently returned to this picture and asked himself, could this really be Carl Zeissen already watching me? 1963. I found more than a dozen documents from various months of this year. All of them seemed related in some way to my father's attempts to reunite our family. There were moments of fear and even despair in his journal entries from the, this time as well. Does she simply have a much better life in Whisperland? This was what he asked himself on the 21st of April. It breaks my heart to know that my dad imagined my mom abandoning us like that. That wasn't the truth at all, as it would turn out. The reality was much darker. Dad's first direct encounter with SSD officer Carl Zeissen would only be a taste of the frightening and awful things that our family would suffer at the hands of the East German secret police. I vaguely remember this visit, only in so much as I remember a strange man knocking aggressively and then making himself quite at home in my father's apartment. My dad was distressed for days after the visit, and it was only after reviewing the journal entries that I now understand why. By my own translation, my father wrote, Your wife has been classified as a Western agent, Officer Zeissen told me. Her return to GDR would likely be a thinly veiled attempt at espionage. As such, she will be refused entry to East Berlin until the GDR has claimed the rest of Germany. She's no spy, I told Zeissen. She just wants to see her son and her husband. Zeissen scowled at my last remark. You should be careful not to make me suspicious. Loyalty to a West German spy makes you an untrustworthy comrade. I begged him to consider that there might be some mistake. Throughout my pleading, Zeissen could only smirk and roll his eyes, and once even spat on my floor. As he was leaving, he added another comment I know to be untrue. You may also find it valuable to know this, Zeissen told me just before slamming my door shut behind him. There is strong evidence that your wife has taken to street prostitution as a way of fundraising for the FRG. I'm told by our informants that she cost as few as 16 marks for an hour to use her. He is a sadistic man, intent only on causing me pain with his visit, though it is veiled by claims of state business. I will not believe his lies. It is true that the Stasi was famous for its use of Zerzitzung tricks to break down citizens. They would only tell the most painful lies and sow distrust wherever it was most damaging. What we call gaslighting in English was an art form in East Germany. I believe that Carl Zeissen observed by father to be strong and simply desired that he be broken. 1966. 1966 was an especially deadly year on the eastern side of the Berlin Wall. Because we were still under GDR control, we wouldn't hear about it until much later. Twelve people died trying to cross the border without permission. Of those twelve, two were teenagers and three were children. Eleven of them died from gunshot wounds. The twelfth was a child from West Berlin of six years old. He drowned after a playmate sent him tumbling into the Soviet-controlled Spree River. Because of the border dispute, those present from both sides of Berlin hesitated to save the child until it was too late. Things were reaching a fever pitch in Germany, and yet, even as the outside chaos was suppressed by the increasingly brutal state, things would still get so much worse in other ways. I remember walking into the apartment with my father one day to find it ransacked. Even my room full of playthings had been thoroughly destroyed. 
I'd been at school with my father at work. I helped my father clean up and check to see if anything was stolen. Nothing was missing, but everything was broken. It was clear, I remember my father saying, that the Stasi had done this to send a message to us. He must have been right because later that night, my father's boss called him on the telephone to say that he had been terminated. Just before dawn, we were awoken by the sound of smashing glass and the clanging din of metal striking metal. My dad's car was totaled by men who did not rush to flee as my father confronted them. Instead, they approached, and one of the masked men extended his weapon, a heavy steel pry bar, to prod my father directly in his chest. I remember watching from the window, fearing that I was about to see my father die. In our driveway, the men exchanged hushed words that I could not hear, and then my father returned to the house, looking as white as a ghost. Father was despondent for weeks after this, but did his best to protect me from the fear that he was feeling. I remember his mood suddenly changing one day. He was previously depressed and meek, but suddenly he was focused and angry in a secretive way that I did not understand. Now, the snuffbox has once again clarified things. In his journal, he wrote on October 2nd, A furtive man arrived at the door early this morning and pressed an unmarked letter into my hand. The letter was in the snuffbox, too. It was from my mother, saying that she loved and missed us terribly and desperately hoped to see her husband and her son before much longer. Some official on your side of the wall has apparently been turfing all my applications to come visit or relocate back to East Berlin, she wrote. I've learned that he is called Carl Zeissen. I've been advised that he may be holding some grudge against you or myself, or both of us, because officials on this side say they've never seen such prejudicial termination of minor claims before. The last document, labeled as being from this year, is a page that Dad apparently tore out of his old school yearbook. An awkward-looking student with hard, glassy eyes was circled and captioned. The name beneath the photo read Carl Zeissen. The caption my father added in red marker reads as translated. She never wanted your affection, so now you spite our family. Disgusting worm. This was the final realization of East Germany's inequities for my dad. He became someone who was willing to murder if that meant leaving this place. 1967. It was July 21st when my father received his wife's death certificate. That was the first page filed in this year within the snuff box. The document said that Mom passed away from illnesses in late February, almost five months earlier in the year. If there had been a funeral, then we had surely already missed it. Mom was gone, and it had been a deliberate act on the part of Carl Zeissen that we missed absolutely all of it. There was so much water damage on the document that I could barely set about understanding it at first. At first I thought perhaps the letter had been allowed to sit in the rain, but then I remembered our old East German apartment building had indoor mailboxes and tiny, useless windows, which we rarely opened. Now... I realize it couldn't have been the rain. I believe my father must have wept over the paper repeatedly, tormenting himself with it for days before he finally stored it away. Father drank and cried, and I remembered this part clearly, without understanding why it should be stored so vividly in my young mind. I was witnessing a transformation in my father, and although I didn't then understand it, I could sense the magnitude of what was happening. After the grief had poured out of him for weeks, his despondent sadness and newly focused hatred for Carl Zeissen became a new and unified mood which frightened me even then. His trauma, transformed into daily periods of wild focus at his craftsman's workbench, he was building something secret and terrible, which he would not let me see. When he was too exhausted to continue working on it, 
He would go into his bedroom and hide it somewhere. Even I didn't know about it. Under the floorboards, perhaps. Shirley planned that even the Stasi, with their home invasions and careful surveillance, couldn't ruin this, his final plan against them. It was only upon reaching the bottom of the snuff-box that I realized what he had made. 1969 The most fascinating document in the snuff-box were the forged papers my dad used to cross the border. I remember how the guards had nearly waved us through when suddenly there was some commotion that I noticed even as a child. Dad was told to leave me in the car and come with the soldiers for a short chat. Looking at the papers now, I can see that they were hastily forged. Spelling mistakes and blurred official seals were the best my father could do in imitating government permission to cross into West Berlin. These subtle hints of forgery aren't the most interesting. What's most interesting are the splatters of dried blood in the papers. The blood-stained sections are circled and marked by my father, and arrows from each brown-red speckle drew the eye to a single note written in German. This blood used to belong to Carl Zeissen, but he doesn't need it anymore. After the note, a grinning smiley face is drawn. Dad's dire entry, on September 6th of this year, explains in more detail about what happened on the day we escaped. I'll translate an excerpt here as best I can. The guards fell for my counterfeit documents, but Zeissen had been tracking me for years, and today's trip was no exception. He arrived just in time to halt our passage and demand that I be questioned more thoroughly. He insisted that he would interrogate me personally, and alone. I'm sure he intended to torture me before I was to be killed or else imprisoned forever. Luckily, I was prepared. I spent weeks fashioning my snuff tool, and I was already carrying it in my pocket. I found the snuff tool that Dad was talking about, too. It was something like a captive bolt pistol that he had designed to be fired using a gunpowder cartridge that was loaded inside. Dad must have cleaned off the bits of flesh and dried blood from the heavy bolt because there was little evidence that it had been used at all. Inside the propulsion mechanism was the sooty residue of burnt gunpowder. The device had certainly been used at least once. Zeissen was in such a rush to begin beating me that he didn't have me searched first. He even ordered the guards to return to their post outside, likely so they wouldn't hear me screaming while he tortured me. This was a stroke of extreme good luck, because it allowed me to return to the car without anyone witnessing what happened next. After the door was closed, I approached with purposeful meekness, as though begging for his understanding. When I was within arm's length, I stepped forward and put one hand tightly over his mouth and pressed the snuff tool against the side of his skull near the temple. He knew what was happening, and so he struggled hard, driving a knee toward my groin and sending his forehead slamming away from the wall in an attempt to headbutt me. I resolved myself even further in killing him, but fumbled with the snuff tool as I drove it forward and triggered the bolt of fire. I'd done my best to impale his brain with my tool, but his squirming sent the bolt somewhere else instead. As I pushed him backward to retrieve the snuff tool, I saw that the steel intrusion had not penetrated the skull, but instead pierced through the front of his throat near his voice box. The choking, strangled wheeze of air that Zeissen hissed out as he tried to scream for help, I silenced him, but not dealt a lethal blow. Covering the new hole in his neck with one hand, he weakly tried to push past me toward the door. I followed and allowed him to retrieve his keys and move a trembling hand toward the lock. It was then that I pushed him down hard into the corner of the interrogation room. He fell forward on his hands and knees. I put one of my boots between his shoulder blades and made him rest flat against the smooth cement floor. Kneeling over his eisen, I pocketed the snuff tool and instead filled both of my hands 
with thick fistfuls of his hair. I pulled his head up with all the strength in my arms, while my foot kept his shoulders planted firmly against the floor. I estimated that it took twenty seconds of this before a loud cracking came from Zeisen's neck. The pressurized hiss of air from the new hole in his trachea no longer wheezed out forcefully. When I untangled my fingers from the man's hair, his head fell forward limply and struck the floor hard enough to unleash some of the blood that it was inside. The thick, Visceral blood from his broken spine started pooling to fill his mouth, too, and out the new hole that my snuff tool had made. There was no more bright red droplets. Everything was congealing into the purple ooze of death, although I only stood over the dead man for what felt like less than two seconds. I collected my documents and returned to the car as though a simple clerical concern had now been resolved. The guards waved us through, looking down at myself after we were safe. I saw how much of Zeisen's blood I'd gotten on myself and smeared on the documents by mistake. The guards must have seen the terrified look in my eyes and simply assumed that the blood was my own. From Germany we made our way to Austria, where we lived until I was ten years old. My father obtained a worker's visa to the U.S. when I was eleven, and we've stayed here ever since. My father never remarried, and I miss him every day since he's passed, but there is one thing that makes me very glad to know. In all the photographs that he and I have taken since moving to America, that haunted look in his eyes has never once made a reappearance. Losing my mother turned my father into something almost craven, someone willing to murder an enemy at a moment's notice, if it meant not losing any more. After Zeisen died, and he knew that I, at least, was safe, I think my father returned to who he really was. He never wore that haunted look around me, never once during my childhood, and not even on his deathbed. The bad memories had been stored away somewhere safe, banished to the snuff-box, so that they could not escape until he was done being my father. His work is done now, and I'm glad to understand what he did for me. The picture of Dad standing next to my mom from 1961 is now in a frame by my bedside. The sadder parts of his story are locked back up in the snuff box. I put the steel container under my bed, just like Dad used to do. I've set the bad memories aside to make room for joy, but I won't ever forget that they're there. Today's episode of Scary Stories Told in the Dark is proudly brought to you by Monday.com. Hi, Otis here. These days, when you're working on team business projects and you're here and the rest of the team is anywhere but where you're at, it kind of makes things difficult, right? Monday.com can fix that. Everything is in one place, providing a flexible platform which allows you to manage people, projects, and external tools in one easy place. And Monday.com has a free 14-day trial so you can test it out. The best thing about Monday.com is you don't waste time on sync meetings, emails, or looking for an updated version. Monday.com keeps your team connected from anywhere. And best of all, Monday.com is easy to use. It's flexible, improves coordination between your teams and departments, and you can customize it to fit a specific workflow. And with that ease comes confidence. Team confidence comes from knowing that everyone is focused on the work that matters most, has an impact on the organization, and managers know exactly what's going on with their employees. And it shows the progress of your work to clients, stakeholders, or managers with easy, trackable accomplishments. There are ready-to-go templates with built-in solutions for your industry-specific workflow. Be it marketing, sales, CRM, construction, HR, real estate, IT, media production, and so much more. Simply put, Monday.com brings teams together so you can plan, manage, and track everything your team is working on in one centralized place. 
At Scary Stories Told in the Dark, I work with the members of our production team, specifically the show's creator, Craig Groshek, every week. And due to the fact that we're literally thousands of miles away from each other, the only way we can make this magic happen is remotely. And it hasn't always been an easy task. Back in 2014, when we started, we didn't have options like we've got now, so we just did the best we could. But now, Monday.com is here to help, and they've got what it takes to solve those problems and prevent them from ever getting in the way of our success again. Now, we can't imagine a world without Monday.com. So if you want your team to be more effective than ever, visit Monday.com for your free two-week trial. Build confidence within your team and reach every goal with ease. Visit Monday.com for your free two-week trial. When your teamwork is effective, nothing can stop you. Go to monday.com to start your free 14-day trial today. That's M-O-N-D-A-Y dot com. Let them know that Otis sent you. Thanks so much for your support of this show and our sponsors who help make my program possible. I hope you enjoyed I Inherited My Father's Snuffbox, as written by David Fueling and performed by yours truly. If you enjoyed that first story and would like to help support the author and read more of the author's work, you can do so by picking up a copy of their latest collection of short stories entitled Modern Dread, available now on Amazon. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com slash dread. That's simplyscarypodcast.com slash dread, spelled D-R-E-A-D, and you'll be redirected to Amazon, where you can explore the author's latest and his catalog of other books today. Also, as an Amazon associate, a portion of your purchase made using that URL is provided to us as well as the author. David's latest, Modern Dread, was just released on October of 2019, and it contains not only more of his sterling work, but tales from other amazing authors as well, including Charlotte O'Farrell, Derek Hawk, and the inestimable Micah Edwards, whose work has been featured previously on this very program. In Modern Dread, you'll find four awe-inspiring short stories from its varied authors. For example... In Charlotte O'Farrell's All We Lost, a group of podcasters traveled to the site of an unexplained mass disappearance. While investigating the infamous mystery, they come face to face with their own worst nightmares. Who will make it out? You'll have to pick up a copy to find out. And in Derek Hawk's Tabitha, we visit a world filled to the brim with ancient evils, witchcraft, demons, and gods. And in this place, a little girl and her mother struggle to survive these horrors in order to fulfill the last prophecy spoken by her people to return that which was stolen from her ancestors. Sound too good to be true? It's not. Purchase your copy of Modern Dread by David Fueling and several other talented authors today at simplyscarypodcast.com slash dread. You won't be sorry you did, and when you do, be sure to leave a five-star review and a kind word on Amazon, and let the authors know you heard about them here on this show. Thanks again for your support of this podcast and of tonight's featured author. Up next, we've got a second tale of terror for you, courtesy, once again, of David Fueling. In it, we'll meet Sarah Hatley, a young woman with a knack of finding things others would rather steer clear of and one man who has had enough of her shenanigans. Without further ado, I present to you The Dowsing Girl. That damn Sarah Hadley is dangerous. She's been dowsing for dead animals ever since the last of the winter snow melted. The Hadley girl is always carrying that same crooked bit of willow branch. Sarah holds it out in front of herself with her eyes closed, and then makes faces like she's detecting something invisible in the air. She calls it her sensing stick. 
I've seen her digging things up, too. She's telling everyone who asks that she can make the little corpses feel better again. We'll admit that I've noticed a strange abundance of squirrels and blue jays in the parklands this year. Maybe that's just an eerie coincidence, though. The recent winter's snowfall in Ashland was also irregularly heavy. Sometimes things are related, and sometimes they aren't. Speaking of things that might, or might not, be connected, almost a dozen people went missing this winter. Not a single one of them is returned or otherwise been found. The police are starting to think these incidences might all be related. In the papers, it's been theorized that a single unknown assailant might be living here in town. They've started calling this unknown person the Ashland Flare. No official leads on a suspect yet, though. That's even despite all the body parts that started turning up around town. It's ugly business, to be sure. Sarah's 19 with the mind of an 11-year-old. Physically, she's more like a young man. The girl is nearly six feet tall and broad in the shoulders. She's not just big. She's got muscles all over her body. I've caught Sarah on my property a few times now, and each time I'm afraid to have her anywhere near me. She climbs the chain link to let herself into my backyard without my permission. I've had to chase her off every time that she's done it. Her dowsing rod keeps bringing her back. I don't keep pets, and I never did. I've told her that several times now, but she doesn't seem to believe me. Neighborhood kids have started saving up their lunch money and allowances to hire Sarah. They want her to bring back the dead pets. She's more than happy to accept all their pocket change and crumpled up bills they managed to bring her. Parents have started to worry, and I've decided to start being more vocal about my own concerns. It's felt good to share my anxiety with others in the community. There's no question that Sarah Hatley will keep stirring up trouble in Ashland. If she hasn't done so already, she'll soon go way too far. The kids have started sneaking out after night. Even stranger, there's stories about pets coming back. Parents shrug it off, mostly. Mundane explanations are quickly found, because the only alternative is to believe Sarah's claims. It's a nuts, same dog. They say it's just an oddly similar animal that's wandered into town. Coincidences like that seem harmless enough at first. I've seen a few families chasing animals away, though, too. The father shouts and brandishes some makeshift weapon while standing in the driveway, and the mother waits nearby until the animal is out of sight. Usually she's trying to convince her crying children that it wasn't their dog that's being chased off. It's hard to tell how much Sarah understands because she's developmentally delayed. She could be a killer. That's certainly true. It wouldn't take a wild stretch of imagination to think of her bludgeoning or stabbing a man to death. She's a remarkably strong girl. Sarah might easily fill the role of the Ashland Flair. The only missing piece is a demon in her heart. In my opinion, that's what makes someone lash out to kill a stranger. When you look at a person from the outside, there's no way to tell whether that demon is there. I heard rustling outside my window last night and retrieved my gun before heading to investigate. I clicked on the porch light as I stepped outside. At the periphery of the illuminated area, I found Sarah Hatley creeping near the side of the house. She looked dazedly in my direction as I leveled my rifle at her. You damn girl, I hissed loudly. You're trespassing. Maybe it took her eyes a moment to adjust to the floodlight that I'd brought outside with me. When she recognized the firearm that I carried, Sarah's face changed briefly into an expression of obvious anxiety. There's dead animals buried here, she stuttered out. Her face returned to tranquil blankness as I lowered my gun. 
but a trace of fear remained. That damn stupid dowsing rod of hers was still pointed in the direction of my house. The tip of the branch wavered gently in the air as Sarah's hands began to tremble. I could tell that she was still thinking about how she had risked getting shot. I don't keep any pets, I told her yet again, and never have. I shouldered my rifle as though I was ready to drive Sarah off my property by force. She made the same anxious face as before. I don't want to see you here ever again, I growled. Awful sorry, mister, she responded. But there's dead critters here that want healing. Looking crestfallen, she turned and started walking in the direction of her own house. I kept my gun at hand and the porch light on as I watched her leave. Sarah lifted herself over the chain-link fencing at the border of the property and continued walking into the darkness until I could no longer see her. Maybe I overreacted, but could you really blame me? The local newspapers published another story about the Ashland Flare this morning. The flyer has been connected to another disappearance that happened in the late hours of New Year's Eve. The police claim that they're narrowing their list of suspects, but they haven't arrested anyone yet. That's got me feeling scared. The last thing I need now are random townsfolk sulking around on my property. If I let my guard down, then I'm risking my own neck. I suppose that's true for anyone, isn't it? One of the strange dogs that's supposed to have been healed by Sarah caused some serious trouble today. It went berserk and started biting the kid that paid Sarah to bring his old dog back. By the sound of it, the kid took some really nasty bites. It was basically mauled. Finally, the people of Ashland are starting to organize against that weirdo clan of Hadley's. The mother and father are just as odd as Sarah is. Maybe they're afraid of their own daughter. Could that be why they never speak up about her behavior? The boy that was mauled returned from the hospital today. He wore some fresh stitches in his neck down near the collarbone where the teeth had gone in. He's claiming that it's his fault that the dog bit him. He says that Sarah didn't do anything wrong. Apparently he did something that used to bother his dog before it died. He did it to test whether his new dog was really the same one he buried last summer. He says that's how he's certain now that the creature that bit his throat open can only be verified as the body of his old pet. That irrational fool of a boy says that he still loves his childhood pet. Some people from the town went out to confront the Hatleys last night. I was among them. Sarah's parents were shy and did not seem to take our anger seriously. They meekly defended their daughter. They proclaimed that their family was innocent on all counts. The father claimed instead that the evil happenings around Ashland must be coming from somewhere else. The Hatley's mother even dared to whisper that there was something particularly strange about my own property. I spat in anger to hear it, and then I loudly called the whole family devil worshippers. I said it right into their faces and did not grant any of them a single batted eye of doubt or sympathy while the family denied it. The town was mostly on my side by the end of it. We'd decided by now that the Hatleys were no good. The police continued to provide no real answers about the disappearances that occurred over this past winter. It's become something of a nightly routine for many people in Ashland to carefully check their surroundings before bed. Some from the community like to watch their yards from behind the barely parted blinds that obscure their upstairs windows. Other people are brave enough to step out onto the sidewalk near their homes to talk with neighbors. Eventually, we all go inside and lock up extra securely at dusk as it wanes tonight. I've started to complain more openly about that damn Sarah Hadley. I think she's the sole source of all this trouble. That's what I tell the parents of those children who have asked for five or ten dollars to give the Hatley girl. They want their dead pets back, and 
She's playing along with a perverted sort of glee in order to keep pocketing their money. She's just a girl, some of them responded. Sarah's a grown woman and stronger than some men, I tell them. My correction of this detail is stern enough to make most people's eyes flit nervously away from me. No one wants to look me in the eye because I'm saying things that disturb them. She's strong and strange enough to drive a knife into someone who doesn't suspect it. I declared aloud more than once. And she's sneaky enough to find people who would make good targets. It was a Sunday morning when Sarah Hatley finally went too far. She found something in the town square that Ashland police had completely failed to notice. I was one of the first people to gather around her as Sarah started prying up the cement pavers that were there in the public promenade. She looked to be keen on revealing a section of soil that was hidden underneath. Reaching down into the dirt with her bare hands, Sarah quickly uncovered the rigor mortis arm of a corpse. It had been buried only inches beneath the surface of the ground. The killer had covered the body with little more than a dusting of dirt and then simply crunched the heavy cement pavers back on top of the shallow grave that had been made there. Now Sarah was gripping the corpse by its exposed wrist. She was heaving with all her strength to bring more of the body up and out of the ground. Those of us who were standing there with Sarah begged her to stop. The police will be here soon, we told her. You don't need to touch the body anymore. Sarah kept digging, though. She was prying at the caked-on dirt with her fingertips to reveal more of the corpse. It soon escalated and became even worse than that, though. Repeatedly, she drew her nose and mouth disgustedly close to the putrefied flesh. Was she smelling it? No, it was even worse than that. Each time that Sarah's face went near the arm, I could see that she was leaving tooth marks behind. That damn girl is biting the body! I screamed in pure revulsion. She's tasting it! My accusation was enough to draw Sarah out of her reverie. She looked up to all of us who were gathered there around her. With a look of fear on her face, she glowered toothily at us and revealed that there were indeed gritty bits of rotten coagulate stuck in and around her mouth. Solidified blood stained the crooked angles between most of her teeth. The saliva from her tongue rehydrated some of the congealed mess, returning it to something like fresh blood flow. The liquefied red trickled down in rivulets from the pouting corners of Sarah's mouth. It's a misunderstanding, Sarah wailed. I found this fellow down here, but I didn't do nothing to him. She let out a scream of frustration. He just needs waking up. I have to wake him up now, or he won't get another chance. He wants to get up here, along with the rest of us. He's begging me to help him wake up. Sarah brought her voice down into something like unintelligible sobbing and remained sitting by the corpse she had unearthed. She sat like that until the police arrived. They put Sarah in a holding cell down at the county jail, and they brought the remains of that corpse to the morgue. It'll take a few days for the body to be identified properly. I reckon that we'll learn a lot more in the coming days, but it's already gotten to the point where the community of Ashland seems to have come to a final consensus. The Hatleys are going to have to be forced out of town. We'll drive them out with weapons and actual bloodshed, if it has to come to that. Even local police and churches seem ready to stand aside and let us take matters into our own hands. I suspect the newspapers won't breathe a word of it if we're ultimately forced to kill them. We'd all be criminally complicit for just defending ourselves and our homes. What sense is there in airing an honest, dirty town's laundry like that? Sarah's back out of jail on a pathetically small bail amount. It was made clear to her that we mainly just never want to see her face again. The Hatleys are packing up everything in their house, and they'll be on the road soon enough. 
I don't know exactly how much of a direct role I've had in purging that clan from my beloved Ashland, but I'm glad, at least, to see that they're finally almost gone. It's an undefinable relief, but I wonder whether this really could be the end of my restless nights. Am I finally safe? You and I are strangers, dear listener, and I'm confident that they will never meet. For this reason, I can at least admit this to you. I'm the one they call the Ashland Flare. The remains of no fewer than thirty victims are buried in the cellar beneath my house. I work in the winter to stifle the smell. By springtime, I've cleaned and preserved all the trophies that I care to keep. I hope, for their own sake, that the Hatley family never tries to come back to Ashland. If Sarah Hatley douses her way back onto my property, she's going to find a lot more than she ever bargained for. I hope you enjoyed The Dowsing Girl by author David Fueling, as performed by yours truly. Up next, we've got a third dose of darkness for you, once again from Mr. Fewing. In it, we'll meet a group of campers who are hoping to get up close and personal with nature. A little bit too close. Without further ado, I present to you, Mosquitoes. July 29th, 1991, 2 p.m. One of the young men spoke breaking the quiet thrum of nature around the group. The marathon winds right through these woods, Geordie. Leroy gestured with a sweep of his hand to indicate the dense wilderness around himself. And you've got two more days to get that blood sample in for testing. Don't the mosquitoes get a lot worse at night? Geordie asked. They do, but that's the point. Leroy answered. When the big day comes, you'll breeze through it. And you'll be allowed to compete, Laura added, because that blood test isn't going away. Bugs and needles shouldn't be a part of riding a bike, Geordie complained quietly. I should be training tonight, not facing my fears on some stupid camping trip. You'll thank us when it's all done, Leroy replied. Getting over your anxiety about lost blood is going to help you qualify for the race, because testing clean is the only way to prove that you're the genuine article. Besides that, you know that getting over your fear of bugs is going to help you maintain focus during the two days of cycling through this forest. I already agreed to all that, Jody muttered, but I still feel afraid. That's okay, Laura answered. She grasped Geordie affectionately by one of his arms and then raised herself up on tiptoe to kiss his cheek. It's normal to feel afraid, honey. That's the nature of any phobia. We're both here to help you get through it, though. July 29th, 1991, 8 p.m. Okay, Leroy announced. You've got your water, snacks, radio, lamp, and plenty of comics to read. You've got a cot so you can sleep as soon as you're ready to crash. Just make it through the night and you'll feel a whole lot better about everything. You won't lose that much blood, okay, Jordy? I promise you'll be fine. The athlete wavered on his feet as though he might faint. These window screens will probably keep most of the mosquitoes out anyway, Jordy said. He ran his hand gently along the vinyl partition. The tone of his voice quickly betrayed that the words were expressed only to reassure himself. Don't count on those, my friend. Leroy grinned. Look, he said suddenly, moving toward the screen. When the bugs are hungry enough, they'll squeeze right through. He snatched up the nearby tabletop lamp and moved to eliminate one of the patio's floor-to-roof screens. In the fading light, there were already countless mosquitoes bouncing against the barrier while others landed and probed carefully for a way through. 
It's already starting, Leroy said. He slapped at an anticipatory itch on his neck. Nighttime here is much worse than the daytime outside. Don't fool yourself. You won't escape being bitten. Jordy took a deep breath and allowed himself to look out into the darkness. He could only see as far as the light from the lamp could penetrate into the thin warm fog of the night air. As Leroy moved to replace the light source onto the patio table, the darkness seemed to approach at that same pace. Jordy observed that Leroy was entirely correct about the tenacious presence of the mosquitoes outside. The bloodsuckers were teeming furiously outside, and their eagerness to press their tiny bodies against the vinyl screens implied that they could already smell the presence of human hosts. Leroy went inside, leaving Jordy there. He locked the door behind him. July 29th, 1991, 10 p.m. Laura and Leroy went together to project their voices through the sturdy door that separated the inside of the cabin from the screened-in patio. They greeted Jordy, and Jordy was immediately there, behind the door with an answer. The timing was rushed, and it quickly became obvious that Jordy had been patiently waiting for them to check in with him. "'Things are bad out here,' Jordy shouted. There was an obvious timber in his voice that betrayed how his teeth were chattering. The night was warm, and so the tremors they heard in Jordy's voice could only be from some manner of sustained terror that was shaking him. "'Things are scary,' he repeated loudly. He was fighting not to let any whiny fear into what he was saying, but that fear seeped through regardless. The bugs are bad out here, he admitted, but I've got them mostly in control. From behind the door, Leroy could hear Jordy slapping at his own body. The sound implied that Jordy was striking everywhere. He slapped at his own arms, chest, back, thighs, calves, and elsewhere. He struck with a consistent rhythm, it was surely painful and exhausting. Just let them bite you, Jordy, Leroy shouted. The point is not to feel afraid of them anymore. You don't want to get distracted and fall off the bike just because your hands are busy swatting bugs. It's so much worse than I thought it would be, Jordy said. His voice was barely audible through the door. I didn't realize it could ever get as bad as this. The athlete sounded weak. His words wavered as though... You were feeling very faint. You can brave it out, Shorty. Laura called through the door. I love you, baby. Uh, I can brave it out. Shorty repeated mutely from behind the door. July 30th, 1991, 12 a.m. Please, please let me in. I give up. I want to come inside. Shorty hammered out a steady and measured rhythm on the door. One fist and then the other struck weakly in a one-two cadence against the wood. He must have been exhausted because the blows of his hands barely rattled the door in its frame. I can't sleep, Jordy called out. They're crawling all over me. I want to be let in. None of this is worth it anymore. Forget the marathon and forget the blood test. None of this. I just don't want to be out here anymore. Don't say that, Jordy, his friend scolded him. Leroy was seated safely on an entryway bench next to the exterior door. Laura listened to the conversation from a chair in the living room. Neither of those inside had seen their friend since he first went outside and was left alone. "'I know you too well, Jordy. Leroy called through the door. "'You'll be mad at yourself if you give up now. "'You'll get mad at all of us. "'The failure will stick in your head.' Then this will all be for nothing. Nothing's going to stick in my head, Jordy responded. I promise I'm not going to be mad at all. His voice sounded like a sob. I'm scared and I don't want to do this anymore. We can't let you in, Jordy. <laughs> Leroy chuckled reproachfully. We made a promise to get you through tonight. You remember that, don't you? From behind the door, there came a sniffling sound and then several beats of silence. It was clear that Jordy had thrown the brakes on his own quiet sobbing. I remember, 
Jordy shouted it loud enough to make his voice crack. But please, he added more quietly, don't make me do it anymore. July 30th, 1991, 3 a.m. Laura, I'm not feeling so good. Jordy's voice arrived weakly through the solid wooden door. I'm all bitten up. Every part of me hurts. Even my tongue is swollen. They didn't bite your tongue, Jordy. Laura did her best to answer kindly and calmly. She wanted to reassure him. Try to sleep. It'll be morning soon. I tried to keep them up, but they've bitten me everywhere, on my tongue, in my eyes, even on the palms of my hands. They're under my clothes now. They're going inside me. They didn't bite your eyes, Jordy, she told him. I love you, Laura. Jordy replied and then fell silent. He made no more sound, even after Laura bid him good night and went to her room. July 30th, 1991, 7 a.m. Laura woke first in those post-dawn hours. She rose from the bare mattress on the floor of the back bedroom and creaked on wooden floorboards until she was downstairs in the kitchen. She woke Leroy, who was asleep on the couch in the living room, with a gentle shake of his shoulder as she passed him by. Leroy yawned and then lurched his body into his sitting position. He rubbed at his eyes while Laura set a pot of coffee brewing in the kitchen behind him. Both of the survivors assumed that Jordy was asleep outside. It was a natural thing to assume that Jordy was alive. The pair called out to him, and when he did not answer, they knocked gently on the door in an attempt to wake their friend outside. When Jordy didn't answer, they simply set about having breakfast without him. Judging by how absolutely all sound had ceased outside, there was surely nothing wrong. In fact, the morning was gorgeously peaceful. As Leroy turned his ears to listen, there arrived barely even a hint of squirrel chatter or bird song from the wilderness outside. When breakfast was done, it was Laura who ran out first to shake Jordy awake and congratulate him. At first, Laura didn't even recognize that a corpse was there with her on the patio. The remains in the sleeping bag barely filled the nylon sack enough to lift it off the ground and show that anything was inside. When Laura checked the sleeping bag, her scream brought Leroy out to join her. They didn't seem to understand that they had found Jordy's body. Even after the police arrived to take Jordy away, they didn't seem to understand what they had seen. The body didn't look anything like Jordy had looked like when he was alive. At least three times before they left the cabin together in the early evening of that day, Laura and Leroy called out aimlessly into the woods together. They were shouting for Jordy to please come back. It didn't help at all, of course. Jordy hadn't left them until he was forced to go. The police refused to speculate on any cause of death before a coroner from the city performed an autopsy. They didn't release the body for burial until well after the summer races were over. Things proceeded mostly as normal in those early days of August. Jordy's absence on the day of the race was an irregularity that was perceived as horrifying only to those who understood the whole story. August 3rd, 1991, 10 a.m. Two microphones were perched at uneven angles on the announcer's desk in front of Jim and Sylvia from Channel 8's local news. The day of the race drew meager fanfare, and so only a few stations saw fit to set up booths and report live from the event. A single camera was sufficient for Channel 8 in this case. It would be more than enough to provide highlight clips for the weekend report. Good morning to those of you watching from home, said Jim. He nodded amiably toward the camera. It's a beautiful day for a race. Are you enjoying the weather, Sylvie? Oh, absolutely, Jim. Sylvie leaned slightly forward to speak into her microphone. The sun is out and the air is crisp. It's perfect for our racers today. She drew in an audibly deep breath and then let it back out. Jim smiled at her with a showman's appreciation before he spoke again. The thing that really surprises me, Sylvie, he 
said, is the complete lack of mosquitoes this morning. They're usually out here pretty thick by now. Remember last year? Well, don't jinx us, Jim. Sylvie laughed. You better knock on wood. Right, Jim smiled. He tapped gently with two knuckles on the announcer's podium in front of him. I'll knock on wood that it stays just like this. I do have to admit, said Sylvie, I've never seen it so perfectly clear on race day. It's never been like this before. What do you think, Jim? Are the mosquitoes doing us a favor? Maybe they already had a big meal just before this. Jim answered with a polite laugh. But it's an absolutely perfect day for a race, that's for sure. It's a perfect day for a race, Jim. Sylvie agreed. I hope you enjoyed Mosquitoes by author David Fueling, as performed by yours truly. If you enjoyed the tales you've heard tonight, I'd like to remind you one last time that tonight's featured author has an amazing selection of his stories for sale on Amazon.com, including collections of his short tales, as well as several longer works. In David's latest, Modern Dread, which you'll find on Amazon, the author stretches his experimental style to the limit through his telling of The Lossy Incident, reality-bending antagonist, astral projection, deep web plot lines, and reader interactive encryption puzzles make this story a mind-bending digital horror story truly unlike any other. And as if that's not enough, in addition to the three we've already mentioned, you'll get a fourth epic tale from Micah Edwards, entitled Alterations, which will draw you into a budding mythos. In Micah's tale, a simple scratching sound in the basement leads one man on a twisted journey which bends the rules of reality itself. As gains and sacrifices mount, can he keep hold of who he was? Again, you'll have to pick up a copy of the book to find out. You can get Modern Dread, and David Fielding's other amazing works today from Amazon.com. Just visit simplyscarypodcast.com slash dread, spelled D-R-E-A-D. Once more, that's simplyscarypodcast.com slash dread, and you'll be redirected to Amazon, where you can get started giving yourself the creeps today. And again, if you give any of David's works a try, Please leave him a quality review and a kind word, and be sure to let him know you heard about him here on this program and that Otis Jiry sent you. It would mean a lot to me. Thanks again for your support of this show and of tonight's featured author. I'd also like to take a moment to thank you for joining me for this episode of Scary Stories Told in the Dark. If you enjoyed what you've heard on today's program, please take a moment to stop by our iTunes page, or wherever else you listen to your favorite podcasts, and leave us a five-star review and a kind word. It makes a huge difference and would mean a lot to us. If you'd like to hear a premium extended edition of tonight's and all of our other episodes featuring twice the terror, visit simplyscarypodcast.com today and click the Patrons link in the menu at the top of the screen. You'll find yourself at chillingtalesfordarknights.com where you can purchase season passes for this podcast and our other quality storytelling programs, or become a patron for as little as $5 per month and get access to our entire audio archive dating back to 2012, all of it ad-free. If you happen to use Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or YouTube, you can follow and subscribe to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights there, where you'll get all of our latest updates and new releases and have the chance to interact with us each and every week. You can subscribe to me on YouTube as well at the Otis Jiry channel, where you'll find releases of my series, Horror Storytime, dating back to 2014. And you can find me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram too. Just search for Otis Jiry. Until next week, stay spooky and get some sleep. If you can. <laughs>
Thanks for listening. You've been listening to Scary Stories Told in the Dark, a production of Chilling Entertainment and the creative team at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights, and a proud member of the Simply Scary Podcasts Network. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com today to learn more about our network and our other amazing storytelling programs. Tonight's program was hosted, and its featured stories performed by yours truly, Otis Jiry. Selected stories have been adapted with the kind permission of their respective authors. Original music provided by Luke Hodgkinson and Jesse Cornett. Sound design and final mixing and mastering provided by executive producer and director Craig Groshek. Program's artwork and logo by David Romero. If you're looking for some fresh tales on a daily basis while waiting for the next podcast, check out my YouTube channel, the Otis Jiry channel, and my extensive collection of narrated tales there. Simply search on YouTube by my name and you'll find me. And don't forget to subscribe and press the bell notification icon to get my latest releases. Got a scary tale of your own that you'd like performed? I take submissions. Email it to me today at otis at simplyscarypodcast.com to have your terrifying tome considered for production in a future episode of this show. That's O-T-I-S at simplyscarypodcast.com. If you've enjoyed what you heard on tonight's program and are joining us on your favorite podcast app, subscribe to us to be sure you never miss an episode and leave a five-star review and a comment. Your feedback means a lot to me. You can also follow Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and yours truly on Facebook to connect anytime and get the latest updates on this and other programs and my channel. If you're listening on the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights YouTube channel, do us a favor and hit the subscribe button and the bell notification icon for CTFDN as well to get more spooky tales from me and the crew and another episode of this program each and every Wednesday. And don't forget to hit that thumbs up button to tell us how we're doing and leave a kind word or a request. And don't forget to visit us at ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com and consider supporting the team by becoming a patron. In addition to helping us out, you'll get exclusive access to our audio archive and ad-free downloads of all your favorite stories, including those you've heard on this program. As for me, I'll be back next Wednesday with more terrifying tales to keep you up all night. But that's all right. Who needs sleep anyway? <laughs> <laughs>